All right, I spent uh, almost all of last week introducing the book of Hebrews, and what I want to do is to repeat some of that quickly. You know how I work, I'll do that less and less as we go on, but I want to repeat some of that just so uh, some who may not have been here and to remind those who, who were here a little bit about how I'm seeing the background. I told you there, you know, this is one of these books you can, people argue about it more than some others because there's, you know, you do have to do some heavy duty detective work and you have to weigh things. So you can, you have people who would say, uh, go along with the, with the introduction part, how I understand the background of the book. And then you'd find other people who say, no, I, I weigh it differently. And I think it was written to people over here or something like that. So let me repeat to you at least how I understand it, what I think about the background with, with a number of modern scholars. I think Hebrews was written to a group of Christians who were being tempted to reject Christianity, to return to some form of Judaism. Okay, which means that they were at least largely Christians who'd previously identified with Judaism. That would mean, of course, that many of them, no doubt, were ethnic Jews who had converted, people like the Apostle Paul. But a good number of them could have been Gentiles who had been affiliated with Judaism. They either could have been Jewish proselytes, Gentiles who had converted, or uh, God-fearers, you know, Gentiles who hung out uh, around the synagogue but had never converted. They knew a lot about it and felt a, a bond with Judaism. So you could have Gentiles in this crowd also, but the, the point is, is that they had been affiliated with Judaism. Now what was tempting them to revert to Judaism, it's not spelled out, it's only hinted at, but it seems to have included being tired of bearing the shame of living outside the mainstream of their cultural heritage. And I hope you can appreciate the power of that. That's the kind of thing that we face. You know, we look at this and say, well, that's just people being pulled back. to. But you see, it's a cultural thing they wanted to identify with that. They were raised in Judaism. And they, that's where they, you know, they focused on that. And it was a big pull to them. And in our culture, we have people who are pulled by other things. They want to, they want to identify with other aspects of the culture. And so they're being pulled by that. That seems pretty clear. And it also seems that there was some doctrinal blurring of the distinctive place of Christ and quite possibly a fear of persecution. As I mentioned last week, Judaism was recognized by the Roman authorities as an official religion. Uh, Christianity was not. And that wouldn't happen for a number of years. But, uh, so you can see that you know, there was a, a, identifying with Christianity had greater risk than identifying with Judaism. So it could be you know, some combination of those. Now the purpose of the letter was to urge these Christians to hold fast to their confession of faith. And the theme the writer sounds for that purpose, he warns the readers not to turn from the Christian faith. The way he does that is he pounds the unqualified supremacy of Christ. If you have people who are being tempted to turn away from Christianity, to turn away from Jesus, and to go back, be it to Judaism, be it to the world, be it to anything, the antidote is to teach them and preach to them the unqualified supremacy of Christ. They have to see what they're turning from. You see, you're going, to, you're going to turn from this. And so he, he does that, he, he presents that uh, quite powerfully. Now the recipients probably were a segment of the Roman church. Now this is disputed, I went through it last week. Uh, <clears throat> this is a conclusion many people hold, I think it's reasonable. Can you show it with mathematical certainty? Of course not. But I think it's reasonable that he's writing, these Christians to whom he's writing, they were a segment of the Roman church, perhaps one or more predominantly Jewish house churches, and if that's correct, then the letter probably was written in the mid-60s, okay? So think of it being written to a group of Christians, a specific group of Christians, a subset of the Roman church, perhaps uh, one or more predominantly Jewish house churches in the Roman area. It's probably written then, if that destination's correct, it's probably written then in the mid-60s before you had the outbreak of the extreme persecution under the emperor, Roman Emperor Nero. So we're right on the cusp of that extreme persecution, okay, where you can see it in the air, that, that the emperor is not a big fan. <laughs> he's, not a, uh, you know, he's not a big fan of Christianity, mocking it and this kind of thing, and the straws are in the wind that you see things aren't breaking your way as a Christian. So that all makes sense and, and fits nicely, but like I say, other people uh, weigh that differently. We can't say with any certainty who wrote the letter, I went through all the thing about Paul. Almost certainly Paul did not write the letter, although some people would still hold to that. Uh, whoever this person was, he was a dynamic preacher, highly educated. He was knowledgeable in the Old Testament. 
and also knowledgeable in its interpretation. But who best fits that description in the early church is a guess. And, uh, you know, so a number of people have been put forward. Uh, Martin Luther uh, suggested Apollos. I mean, that's a reasonable guess, but it remains a guess. So the bottom line is we really uh, don't know. Now, as for the development and structure of the argument in Hebrews, I'm going to be following the structure that's presented by George Guthrie in his uh, commentary on the book. Uh, as I said, it's, it's been well received. Uh, is there a consensus about it? No, there's not. But it makes sense to me. He's very sensitive to the differences between exposition and exhortation. And the way he understands the book is you have uh, argument where the person and nature of Christ is expounded upon and then interjected into that. You have these sections of exhortation. So it'll be like a typical preacher. He's talking about something going along long, and then he'll stop and then he'll urge on the basis of what he said. He will urge the people to live this. And I think you'll see that clearly in the first one after he goes and speaks of the uh, supremacy of Christ to the angels. And then he says, look, based on this, we really need to pay attention to what he said. Okay, so I, I think that that's what I'm going to follow as, as much as possible. Uh, now, uh, the exposition, we'll, get, we'll go ahead and chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Having long ago spoken to the fathers many times and in many ways by the prophets, in these last days God spoke to us by the Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe, who being the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature, and sustaining all things by the word of his power, after providing purification of the sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, having become as much greater than the angels, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Well, throughout Old Testament history, as I, I mentioned last week, God spoke to the Israelites through various forms of prophetic communication. You had straightforward speech, of course, but you also had parables and allegories and symbolic actions and recounted visions. But this, his, his final ultimate revelation was given in the first century in and by his son, Jesus Christ. He is the climax of divine communication, the one in whom the piecemeal and diverse revelations of the Old Testament come together and find their fulfillment. So in the Old Testament, we have different ways and times. We have these, these pieces being presented, and the focal point of them is Jesus Christ. He is the climax of divine communication. And this is what the, the writer opens with this declaration. Now, the communication given by God in and by his Son was given in these last days. Meaning that in Jesus' incarnation, his crucifixion, resurrection, his ascension, and his pouring out of the Spirit, through that complex of events, that is the beginning of the last days. And we went through that some last week, and I cited some texts for you, and I, re I read this quote of Douglas Moo. So I'll just read this again for you quickly. Read one more of Stott, and then that's where we ended, and we'll pick up. He says, with the death and resurrection of Jesus and the pouring out of the Spirit, the last days have been inaugurated. The final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here's the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last. What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is, from the time of the early church to our own day, near or imminent. Every generation of Christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia, the return, the second coming, could occur at any time, and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization. So when he talks about this in these last days, he's talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ that came in the first century. Here's how John Stott puts it in his commentary on the book of Romans. He says, what the apostles did know is that the kingdom of God came with Jesus, that the decisive salvation events which established it his death, resurrection, exaltation, and gift of the Spirit had already taken place and that God had nothing on his calendar before the parousia. It would be the next and culminating event, so they were and we are living in the last days. It is in this sense that Christ is coming soon. We must be watchful and alert because we do not know the time. Okay, so I talked about that. Now, Back here in this section, there, there's plenty here. In verses 2 through 4, second part of 2 through 4, we, he talks about the person, the work, 
and the status of the Son. And one of the things he says is that God appointed the Son heir of all things. See, now this is, this is an indication of the Son's greatness and glory. He was appointed heir of everything. You know, who gets that? Who gets to inherit everything? Well, it's the grandson, the great son, the exalted son. So he's appointed heir of everything, and this appointment's evident in the fact he took possession of all things, so to speak, when God exalted him to a position of universal authority, when God raised him and made him Lord of all following his, self, his selfless sacrifice for humanity. You see, Jesus is God the Son, but there is a sense in which he lowered himself, and he'll talk about this in chapter 2. He made himself, in a sense, lower than the angels and that he subjected himself to human authority. He made himself lower, and it is in that sense that God then takes him after this selfless sacrifice and exalts him. And you see this repeated in the New Testament, that it is God after Christ's selfless sacrifice who then exalts him and makes him Lord of all. You see it, for example, in Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, 1 Corinthians 15, 27, Philippians chapter 2, 9 through 11, Colossians chapter 1, 15. So it is in this exaltation after his, after his project, after his coming to die for us, that God then takes him. Does that mean he ever ceased to be God? Of course not. He can't cease to be God. He is God. He's God the Son, but there is a sense in which he is a human being, he becomes a human being, submits himself to human authority, becomes lower than the angels, they abuse him, crucify him, he's under their authority, and God then takes him and exalts him. Lord of lords. And if you read that passage in Philippians we studied last quarter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, you see that he is exalted, and it is this exaltation that the writer is focusing on. Craig Coaster, who wrote a commentary on Hebrews in the Anchor Bible series in 2001, he says a ruler would designate the son as his heir so that when the ruler died, his son would govern the kingdom. The peculiarity here is that God, the testator, doesn't die. Instead, the son enters into his inheritance and kingly power through his own death and exaltation. The Son's inheritance of all things through his resurrection and exaltation points to the fulfillment of God's promise that the heir of David's throne would receive the nations as his inheritance. So when he's speaking here and he talks about uh, you know, God appointed the Son heir of all things, that's what he's talking about. It is an indication of the greatness of Jesus Christ, and he was appointed heir of all things, that shows he came into the possession of all things. And when did that hap happen? It was at his exaltation. It is when he, is, he ascends and is raised above all, made king of kings, lord of lords, ultimate ruler and power. And he wants them to see this is the Christ uh, from whom you're turning. And that's what we have to see. You see, when somebody sits here and says, well, I think I'm going to go back and hang out in the world. I want to go hang out and do whatever it is I do. I want to get stoned. I want to do this stuff. Okay, but do you see, do you see you're turning from the almighty, absolutely, holy, exalted one for what? You're turning back to what? Slop. You have to see that. And so that's what he's doing, and he's going to beat this theme hard. Okay, but you see it here just in this opening that he's the exalted son. He says, he says that God made the universe through his son. Now think about that. You know, I get, I, I, we sit here and we talk about, you know, yeah, Jesus, he was a great religious leader. You know, he's one of them. We got Siddhartha, you know, the Buddha. Uh, we have Confucius. Uh, you know, we have Muhammad. And we got Jesus. Look. Jesus, he created the universe. Do you see, he's not one among many. He's God. He is God. And so look at this. He sits here, he says, look, he, God made the universe through the Son. God the Son, okay, the eternal second person of the Godhead. God the Son who became the God-man Jesus Christ, took on human flesh in fulfillment of an eternal plan. God the Son who took on human flesh was God the Father's agent in the creation of the universe. This just isn't something that the Hebrew writer says. 
You can see this in other places. You can see it in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3. You can see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. You can see it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Jesus is the agent of creation. Now put that up against some guy who's dead. Some creature who's dead. And so, you know, I just, you know, when people talk like that, I say, well, then you don't understand Christianity. I remember I was having a discussion with a Muslim fellow on the Internet a long time ago. And he started telling me, well, you know, Christians, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't believe that. You know, I have some kind of strange view about Jesus being God. I said, well, then you don't understand what a Christian is. You know, that's it. You don't understand. He's not some teacher. He's not just somebody who's revealing, revealing something. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's God in the flesh. And you see this here, and, and he says it there. And then he says, the Son is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature. See, the glory, this is a way of referring to God because that word is used often in the Old Testament to refer to the luminous manifestation of his being, this idea of his glory. Okay, so it's a way of referring to God and in saying the sun is the radiance of the glory, the writer's suggesting that the sun is so intimately associated with God the Father that to see the sun is to see the Father's glory and presence. He's the radiance of that glory. You know, he is so intimately associated with the Father, he is God the Son. To see him is to see the Father and to see his nature. And that's what he follows with. He then says, put another way, in essence, the Son is the exact representation of the Father's nature. In seeing the Son, one is seeing God expressed in the flesh. He is God incarnate. And we have to see that. We have to understand that, and he wants them to see that. You're not simply turning from some teacher. You're turning from God. And so he, he emphasizes that to them. He says, the Son sustains all things by the word of his power, or more colloquially, by his powerful word. See, the Son not only was the Father's agent in the creation of the universe, he sustains and governs it. He's that powerful. He sustains and governs the cosmos. Without him, it would disintegrate. Think of that. And you see that same idea, same idea mentioned in Colossians 1.17. Paul says, in him, all things hold together. That's the one you're thinking about turning from. Not some dead teacher. Not some fellow traveler who's got his ideas and can stroke his beard and go, yeah, well, let me tell you what I think. You know, because I'm a smart guy. This is God in the flesh. He not only is God's agent in creation, but he holds all things together. You think about that. I just sit there and I said, whoa, this is Jesus Christ. He says the son provided purification for sins. In the sacrifice of himself on the cross, Jesus, of course, provided purification for humanity's sins. That's where it is. You can try all kinds of other things. You can try, you know, to push a peanut around the block with your nose to, you know, do whatever you feel necessary in way of penance and paybacks and all that stuff. You want your sins forgiven? There's one way. There's one avenue. One person provided by God for that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's it. He provided purification for sins. So we all are guilty, right? We all are guilty of sin. And so he provided the purification. Jesus Christ. Why do you think we're here? We are people who've been forgiven. He provided it. And as the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And as John says in verse 9, Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He provided purification for sins. Then he says that after doing that, after providing purification for sins, the son sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he comes and he provides purification for sins through his sacrifice. He ascends to heaven and then he says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now this is a metaphorical reference drawn from Psalm. It's, it depends if you're, looking, if you're reading the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. The versification is different between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Okay, so in the Septuagint, this is Psalm 109, verse 1. In your Bibles, in the Masoretic text, it's Psalm 110, verse 1. Okay, but 
But here it's a metaphorical reference drawn from that psalm to the exaltation and supremacy of Christ. That's what it means when it says he sat down at the right hand. What is he saying? He's talking about this exaltation of Jesus. To the greatest point, the highest authority, King of kings, Lord of lords. There is no authority greater than his. Okay, and they keep, he keeps telling them this, and he's going to tell them this and tell them this. You can see a number of other passages I have written down here. Eventually, these notes will be put up on the website. Uh, that probably won't be till we finish, and so you can go and see the, you can see the citations there. I just don't want to run them all off for you. All right, the fact Jesus sat down. Now, that's sometimes, if you read in theology, it's called his session. Okay, the fact Jesus sat down at God's right hand, it signifies that his atoning work is complete. Okay, so that's, that's implicit in this idea of sitting down. As Hebrews 10, 12, and 13 indicates, now he reigns while he waits, now this is to quote Lane, he waits, quote, for the complete subjugation of every power that resists the gracious redemptive purposes of God. Jesus is exalted, he sits at the right hand of God, and he awaits the complete subjugation of all that resists God's gracious purposes. The last enemy to be, to be destroyed is death. Okay, and he's coming back, and when he comes back, that baby's gone. Okay? Then there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We have to understand that and hold on to that. There, that's a problem. You know, I, I say this, of course, I get off on different things. But, you know, when I look at the kind of stuff that occupies us, the kind of stuff our culture focuses on and thinks is really important, whether it's Britney Spears or something like that, and here we have this story where he said God broke into human history his son died for you was raised from the dead ascended to heaven in him is life the conquest of death and there is a hope of resurrection life for everybody and what do we talk about you know this is what the, this is what the dialogue ought to be about this is what we ought to be focused on and we focus on everything but that okay he's and also it his sitting down, it connotes his authority. As Coaster says in his commentary, he says, those who approach the throne normally stood while the ruler remained seated. Okay, so Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, it shows that his, his work is completed, his atoning work, and it shows it's another indication of his authority. He says, the Son became as much greater than the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to, the, to theirs. See, this is what I was saying before. There's a sense in which Jesus... He, for a little while, was lower than the angels. That's what he says in chapter 2, verse 9. He comes here, he's a human being. He, he is born a human. Okay, he's, of course, the God-man. You sit here and say, well, wait a minute now. How does the eternal God manifest himself in time and space as a human being? Well, that's the mind-blower. Okay, do you think you're the first person to sit here and go, wow, that's a really deep kind of idea. How would that really work out in practice? Do you think you're the first person to think that and to ask that question? Huh? You know, this Christianity has occupied the greatest minds on this planet for millennia. And of course people have thought about that. And the answer is it's a mind blower. Okay? God the Son manifests himself. He becomes the God-man. God in nature, human in nature. He becomes a human being. Now what does he do? He comes here to die. And what does that involve? That involves submitting himself to the authority. Angels aren't under the authority of human beings. Jesus was. He sat here and let them pass judgment on him and say, crucify him. Crucify him. And as I've said before, crucifixion was the cruelest, most shameful death in the ancient world. Can you imagine? That was part of why it was a stumbling block. Because the idea that God would submit to crucifixion the most humiliating death in the ancient world just seemed like nonsense. Why? It's because he wouldn't be subject to human authority. Well, that's exactly what the writer's saying. He was for a little while. He came and submitted himself. And he was crucified and mistreated and, and crucified ultimately. And then here's, what, here's how Hagner puts this. Donald Hagner in his commentary on Hebrews. He says, so he became superior to the angels describes the result of the reference in the preceding clause to Christ's exaltation. Do you see the focus here? It is, he comes, he's a human, he's crucified, and then the Father exalts him above all things. He says, it, is the, it thus refers not to the character of the Son from the beginning. He is God the Son. 
He doesn't empty. He can't cease to be God. He is God, but he's speaking of his humiliation in coming and making himself for a time lower than the angels. He says, uh, doesn't refer not to the character of the Son from the beginning, but to the last clause of verse 3, which refers to the ascension of Christ. In this exaltation to the right hand of the Father, the Son comes to hold a position that indeed was always his by virtue of his identity, but which was set aside during the incarnation. So this is what the writer is telling us here. Now, though many believe that the name Jesus inherited that's superior to the names of the angels is the name Son, and that may be right, I tend to favor what uh, Luke Timothy Johnson in his commentary, he thinks it's the name Lord. Okay, and I tend to favor that. It's certainly in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, it seems clear that the name there that's above every name is the name Lord. And the statement here that the name was inherited, it points back to verse 2, which is a reference to Jesus' exaltation. So I'm thinking that the name is Lord. Whether it's Lord or Son, it doesn't change the point. And then you see in verses 10 and 8, of chapter, 8 and 10 of chapter 1, the names God and Lord are applied to the Son. Okay, so that's just, uh, I think that that's the name. Uh, many other people think it's the name Son. All right, let's go on. All right. Now here in this section, what he's going to do, the, the position of the Son in relation to the angels is going to occupy from chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 18. But you're going to have at least one, one of these uh, hortatory, one of these exhortation interjections, okay, beginning at chapter 2. But he sits here and says here in chapter, in chapter 1, verses 5 through 14, he says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him as a father, and he will be to me as a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Regarding the angels, he says, He who makes winds his angels... And a flame of fire his ministers. And if you're saying, hey, that reads differently in my translation, it does. And I'll explain that in a second. But regarding the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of justice is the scepter of your kingdom. You loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, anointed you with oil of gladness above your companions. And you at the beginning, Lord, firmly established the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will pass away, but you continue and they all will wear out as a garment and you will roll them up as a cloak, as a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same and your years will not end. And regarding which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they, not, are they all not ministering spirits? being sent for service for the sake of those who are about to inherit salvation? All right, let's talk about this. He says here in verse 5, you see the Son's unique relationship to the Father. Okay, Jesus' exaltation to God's right hand made him greater than the angels for or because no angel has been similarly exalted. Jesus is unique in that regard. No angel has been exalted as Jesus is. That is, God never said to any of them, you are my son, today I have begotten you, he's quoting Psalm 2-7. Or I will be to him as a father and he will be to me as a son, 2 Samuel 7-14. No to, to no angel has that been said. Now the argument assumes that there is this inextricable link between being declared to be God's son and being exalted in the manner of Christ. The two are seen as tied together. Okay, they're tied together. To be exalted the way Jesus has been exalted, whether literally, in, you know, to, to be exalted that way is to have God say. The fact of that exaltation that he's been talking about, to be exalted that way as Christ has been exalted is to have God say, whether literally in association with the exaltation or symbolically by virtue of the exaltation, to be exalted as Christ is to have God say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or I will be to him as a father and he will be to me as a son. See, this is why the absence of the declaration to any angel, the absence of that declaration means that no angel was similarly exalted. Okay, and thus that the son in his exaltation was made greater than the angels. If I confuse you with that, let me quote you a couple people here and see if they do a better whack at it. George Guthrie says, he says, the early church understood these passages to refer to Jesus' induction into his royal position as king of the... See, it is in that 
that these things are said. Whether they're said literally in association with this exaltation or induction into the royal position, or whether the very act of doing that is a symbolic statement that today I have begotten you, you are my son. He doesn't say. But clearly these two are tied. That they have to be because of the argument that he's making. He says the early church understood these passages to refer to Jesus' induction into his royal position as king of the universe at the resurrection and exaltation. With these events, God vindicated Jesus as Messiah and established his eternal kingdom. God's becoming the son's father then refers to God's open expression of their relationship upon Christ's enthronement an interpretation that fits both Old Testament context and question. Okay, so I think that's what's being done here. And then here's how Coaster puts it. He says, the author does not specify when the divine, quote, begetting occurred. Most interpreters connect this text with Christ's resurrection and exaltation, since the quotation supports the exaltation mentioned in chapter 1, verse 2, the second part. And since in 5.5 it refers to the eternal high priest in heaven, similarly Acts 13, 15 through 41 relates Psalm 2, 7 to Jesus' resurrection. Acts 4, 25 to 28 relates other parts of Psalm 2 to Jesus' passion. And Romans 1, 4, Paul said that Jesus is declared to be son of God by resurrection from the dead. Okay, so when you sit there and say, well, wait a minute, what about this begetting stuff? Well, this is what it's talking about. It is in the exaltation of Jesus Christ that this was said either literally or symbolically through the act of exalting him. And no angel has been similarly exalted, so to no angel has he said that. And that makes Jesus, you see, extremely uh, exalted and, and superior to the angels. Now back to the, this text here in verses 6 and 7. There's a reference, you see the inferior position of the angels. In this context, he refers to the son as the firstborn... Okay, well, what's the idea there? Well, the firstborn here, it's a title of honor. It's a title of priority and rank. See, the firstborn had special prerogatives, right? I mean, the firstborn, that was, wasn't simply an idea that this is the first one out. It carried an awful lot of thing about uh, important prerogatives of the firstborn. He had a special place in his father's heart. He shared his father's authority, and he inherited a lion's share of the father's property. That doesn't really ring with us. But in that culture, to call somebody the firstborn, you understood it meant exalted, it meant honored. And so he's the ultimate firstborn. And it is because it's indicative of, of his greatness and his exaltation that it's used as a title for him in the New Testament. So that's what he means when he speaks of firstborn here. And the superiority of the son to the angels is evident from the fact that when he brings him into the world, he brings the son into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. He's again quoting a psalm. Okay, now this obviously indicates the son's deity, right? That's why I go, no, you know, Jesus isn't divine. I'm thinking, you know, I'm ready to pull what little hair I have out left. You know, pull it out. What little hair I have. You know, isn't this clear when he says, let all the angels worship him? Well, who gets worship? God gets worshiped. Okay, so clearly, and you know, people say, well, you know, the Trinity's not written in the Bible. You can't find the word Trinity there. Well, you know, I mean, we're talking about concepts and titles we use for concepts. And the concept that there's one God and that you have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all being divine, well, that's how we get the Trinity. You see? He's a three-person being, and I've talked about that, but clearly you see here the Son is divine. So given there's one God, given the Father's divine, the Son is divine, the Spirit's divine, what are you going to do? Well, hey, we have a trinity. That's how that came up. It wasn't some sneaky deal. You know, it's theologians sitting here making sense of what the text says, and then we have a name for it. We call it the trinity. And somebody says, well, the trinity's not in the Bible. The concept is, okay? The concept is. It's there. Okay, so we have this, where we have him, uh, Jesus is, he's superior, you see, to the angels, Obviously, we have this an indication of his deed. Now, there's a question as to when this bringing of the Son into the world takes place. So I tell you, there are all kinds of little naughty things in here. You can read it and get the point, but you sit there and say, wait a minute now. When does, this, when does this bringing the Son into the world take place? Okay, well, the answer to that depends on this word oikomene, which is translated world. Oh, five minutes. See, I hear you guys going, Whew. he's really talking fast today. Okay, but you have, so you have this word oikomene, which, which means world. 
translated world. But what's it referring to? In the context, favors understanding oikumene here is referring to the heavenly world. Okay, which is why many leading commentators take that view here of this word, meaning the reference to the heavenly world. Okay, I think that's probably right. And among those commentators who do that, you have F.F. F. Bruce, William Lane, Guthrie, De Silva, Coaster, Luke Timothy Johnson. So these are some guys who are, you know, have a pretty lot of altitude in the scholarly world. Okay, so you don't have to be crazy or anything to understand it that way. That this idea that the reference is to, take, to his coming into the heavenly world, in that case you see then it's another reference to his exaltation. You see, it, it, when he brings him into the heavenly world, it's at Christ's enthronement upon his ascension to heaven that all the angels bow before him. You see this picture of this glorious exaltation of Christ. When he is exalted, he's brought into the heavenly world, ascended, and all the angels worship him. And it kind of sounds like Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 14 to me. Here's how Lane explains it. William Lane and his, uh, I mentioned last week, he's got a two-volume commentary published, I think, in 90 on, uh, maybe a little after that, in, uh, on Hebrews. He says, the majority of interpreters have identified the entrance of the Son into the oikumene with his incarnation or the parousia, okay, with his second, either his incarnation or his return. Okay, the context, however, points in another direction. It speaks of the sacrificial death of the Son followed by his exaltation. Oikumene, then, concerns neither the incarnation nor the parousia, but the entrance of Christ into the heavenly world following his sacrificial death. Christ's entrance into the world, eston kosmon, in his incarnation entailed the humiliation of being made lower than the angels. That's why he doesn't think that's a very good because the, the Hebrew writer, when he speaks of the incarnation, his focus seems to be that that was his being made lower than the angels. So he doesn't think that fits very well here. Okay? So he says, but his entrance into the oikumenein signified his enthronement and exaltation above the angels. They're all to worship him. Okay? He says, the context requires that oikumene be understood as the heavenly world, world of eschatological salvation into which the Son entered at his ascension. Okay, I just want you to see that. That's, that's a, an idea. That's a possibility. If you think, well, no, I'm, I think the other people who disagree with that have that right. And it's possible that it's a reference to his second coming. I don't think the idea, it seems unlikely to me that it's a reference to his incarnation, although you could make that idea with angels singing at his, his coming. You could, make that, you could make that, but like I said, the writer of Hebrews seems to focus on the incarnation as being his for a while, making himself lower than the angels. Here he's using it this coming into the world for his, his being worshipped by the angels. So it just seems to be, if I was going to pick, I would pick first the idea that oikumene meant brought into the heavenly world, and then second I would opt for the idea of the parousia, the second coming. Is that talking about that? See, at that time, every being, at the second coming, every being, angels included, shall kneel in honor of Jesus' name of Lord, and every tongue shall openly declare that he is Lord. And we looked at that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, right? At the second coming, some will do it freely, others will do it because they cannot resist his power, but every tongue on that day is going to acknowledge that he is Lord. Every tongue, every being, everything will say, yes, he's Lord. A begrudging admission from some, glory for those who've awaited his coming, but everybody's going to acknowledge on that day. Be no rebels then, none. And so it could refer to that, uh, but either way, see, uh, either way I think the, the point there, it, it's clear. The point is, uh, you know, is his supremacy, uh, his superiority to the angels. Now the superiority of the son to the angels is evident from the fact Oh, almost going to, bell's going to ring. Anyway, evident from the fact that God, it says, the way I've translated this, makes winds his angels or messengers and a flame of fire his ministers. Now, under that translation, the meaning is, is the point is that angels, as majestic and powerful as they are, they're in some way comparable just to created things that God uses for his purposes. Look, he can take wind and make it his messengers. So he's doing that. Now, most translations, almost I think all of the standard translations, they turn this around and they would say that he who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, if you think that's the correct translation, then you have, a, a, you have to go another route with what is the author trying to communicate. Okay, but there's a fellow, Paul Ellingworth, I translate it this way, and Paul Ellingworth, who's a very well-known linguist, he works for the United Bible Society, he wrote the translator's handbook for Hebrews, 
uh, he takes the approach that I'm advocating here. But does that mean it's right? No, because there are a ton of excellent scholars who translate NIV, ESV, all of these others who would disagree with Ellingworth. Okay, so I'm just telling you, this is what makes the most sense to me, and given that translation, that's what I think he was communicating. If you reject that, then you have to wrestle with what does it mean as phrased in these other translations. Okay, thank you for coming.